Okay, hello everyone. Uh, I know there are people still coming in, uh, but we'll get started. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, this event includes live captioning, uh, which you can toggle uh, from the bottom of your screens. Uh, just uh, send us a message in the chat if you're having a hard time uh, finding that option. Uh, my name is Amna Mazafar, and I'm the TD Assistant Curator at Mercer Union. Uh, I'm joining you today from Toronto, where I've come to reside as both the, an immigrant and an uninvited guest on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Uh, today, the Meeting Place of Toronto is home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, uh, as we're meeting online. I ask that you take a moment to acknowledge the rightful stewards of the land in which you are situated. So today's forum titled To Go to the Side of the Wreck is the second in a series of three programs conceived and guest curated by Nasreen Hamada. Uh, Nasreen is a Palestinian writer and curator currently based in Kingston, Ontario on Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory. Uh, from 2019 to 2021, they held the position of curator at Plug-in Institute of Contemporary Art in Winnipeg on Treaty 1 territory. Currently, they are the associate curator at Agnes Etherington Art Centre in Kingston, Ontario. So the series of events emerges from Mercer Union's invitation to Nasrin to lead a response extending on the themes of our current exhibition by Onyeka Igwe, The Real Story is What's in That Room. Uh, while the gallery is temporarily closed due to provincial health guidelines, you can still visit our website to view documentation as well as a video walkthrough led by the artist. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to thank our supporters for making programming like this possible. Thank you to TD Bank Group for their generous support of Mercer Union's online engagement activities. Uh, Onyeka's exhibition is made possible with leading support from uh, the Newton Dime Foundation and with support from the Canada Council for the Arts through the Foreign Artist Tours Program. We're grateful to, uh, as, uh, to our presenting partners, British Council and Scotiabank Contact Photography Festival, as well as to Panasonic through their partnership program for cultural institutes. The final program uh, in the series will be held on 9 February at 2 p.m. Eastern, so same time as today. Uh, and we'll put a link to register for that event in the chat and hope you can join us again then. Uh, finally, we'd like to thank Nasreen for all their work and for collaborating with us uh, to bring this series of programs and Onega's project to Canada. Uh, please join me in welcoming Nasreen to take the floor and introduce today's panel of speakers. Take it away, Nasreen. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good evening for some or good morning. I know that Onyek is in London right now and for Galari, it's still morning in Los Angeles. Um, thank you all for attending and thank you so much for the speakers who are here and still wanted to do this considering the circumstances that we're all in right now that is making us more tired and more burnt out than even before. I also want to thank Amna and the staff at Mercer, uh, Julia, Sonia and Beatrice, uh, such an extraordinary team of people that I've had the pleasure to work with over the last few months. As Amna mentioned, this is the second of three series that extends on the themes of Onyeka's exhibition, The Real Stories, What's in That Room? And as guest curator of Forum, I have invited artists, writers, curators to consider Onyeka's propositions in her film, A So-Called Archive, which is a major feature of the exhibition at Mercer. The film for me explores the material and affective traces of archival architectures. And I think this is key to the aesthetic considerations being taken up in the film. These architectures tend to the unrecorded, the cataloged, and yet to be uncovered stories of these sites, conjuring their many hauntings to render a study of the pages, of the film reels, the rooms in which these are held in, the structures that contain them, and that are still occupied by the shadows of empire. I was really interested in thinking about the archive as image or by taking up what compels us toward the archive, how do images then emerge? And in that sense, I think Onyeka's film, along with a lot of the artists featured in this program, the way the archive is constituted through images troubles the ways in which memory is kept both as record and as possession, 
and troubles the bearing that this has on how we tell our stories and how we conjure our lost and disappeared histories. The archive for some of us is signified by loss, destruction, decay, or theft. Its contents taken, disappeared, stolen, never to be seen again. When I was writing this introduction, I was thinking about my obsession, my own obsession with the disappeared archive of the Palestine Film Unit, which contained over thousands of reels of film made by Palestinian filmmakers based out of Lebanon and Jordan and elsewhere who were documenting the formation of the 60s and 70s liberation movements coming out of the refugee camps. These films also contain stories of the people living through this experience and were culturally significant. Because of the wars during that time, especially in Lebanon, the archive was moved to different underground locations to keep it safe. But on one of those relocations during the Israeli occupation of Lebanon, this archive completely disappeared. Remnants of it were found years later. I think one film was found in Italy and was restored. And I think there were some that were found in Leipzig, Germany, but most of it was just gone. And in thinking about this, I wasn't so hung up on what those thousands of disappeared reels contained, although that is extremely heartbreaking. But as someone who is from the diaspora and the generations who come after me and after them, I think what is most important to think about is that what we're left with is this story. So what do we do with it? In thinking about archives as they manifest in our imagining and in some way become about a search for other worlds, other formations, these artists and their practices make it so that the archive never disappears, is never lost, and that is always in the making. Here, archival formations do not adhere to linear time. They are constellations bound to the love we have for our people, our stories, and our lands. Together, we give language to this process, and new languages emerge that inform us of these connections, how they might have been felt or remembered. The visions and the impulses that drive some of us towards this search and those that compel us with this obsession condition a sort of collective engagement. To go to the site of the wreck is the title of this program and is borrowed from Basil Abbas's and Rowan Abourahmi's description of their project, And Yet My Mask is Powerful, which references a poem by Adrian Rich entitled Diving into the Wreck. Basil and Rowan's use of the phrase asks us how we might be equipped, what we would bring with us, how we would survive the encounter. And in bringing together Basil, Rowan, Galare, Onyeka, and Aliyah, the intention is to learn from what they might offer about their practice, to maybe hear about their process-based methodologies, their intuitive and pragmatic research, and to think alongside them about the role of the artist as witness and how the creation of an image in its incipiency might point us toward an archive to come. We go to the site of the wreck with them to learn of the ways in which making is power, constructing the possibilities of new forms in power and expression, and that this might bring us that much closer to something felt otherwise amidst all the destruction and unimaginable violence. Before I introduce the speakers, I also want to quickly talk about the title of the forum itself, which is Let It Matter What We Call a Thing. This is a direct line from the poem by Somas Sharif called Look. Look is also the title of the poetry book in which most of the poems include rewritings of terms from the US Department of Defense Dictionary. Look is a word they use in mine warfare to define a period in which a mine circuit is receptive of influence. In Look, Somaz undoes these definitions of violence, the way she thinks about language and the way she brings attention to its manipulation to serve a violent act is undone by catapulting the reader toward another vision of look that involves a kind of sacred intimacy. Let it matter what we call a thing, she writes. Let it be the exquisite face for at least 16 seconds. Let me look at you. Let me look at you in a light that takes years to get here. So Maz's poem reminds me of how poetry lets us be in the process of feeling how language once changed, changes everything which is so relevant to what we discussed last week with Nadia, Paul, and Anik, and continue to discuss here today. The possibilities abound in the many forms of so-called archives. Basil Abbas and, Abor and Rowan Abourahmi work together across a range of sound, image, text, installation, and performance practices. 
Their practice is engaged in the intersection between performativity, political imaginaries, the body, and virtuality. Their works investigate the political, visceral, material possibilities of sound, image, text, and sight, taking on the form of multimedia installations and live sound image performances. They have exhibited and performed internationally. Onyeka Egui is an artist and researcher working between cinema and installation, born and based in London, UK. Through her work, Onyeka is animated by the question, how do we live together? With particular interest in the ways the sensorial, spatial, and non-canonical ways of knowing can provide answers to this question. Galari Kushbozeron is an undisciplinary artist and writer based in Southern California. Galara's work has been exhibited in New York at the New Museum and Queens Museum, in Los Angeles at Hammer Museum, Lax Art, Human Resources, Visitor Welcome Center, and Plug in ICA Winnipeg, Museo Ex Terrassa, Arte Actual, Mexico City. And Galari was also the recipient of a Graham Foundation Award, the Louis Comfort Tiffany Foundation Award, Art Matters Award, and the Creative Capital Andy Warhol Foundation Arts Writers Grant. She's also the editor of March, a journal of art and strategy, and has published in Contemporary, which she was also the co-founding editor, The Brooklyn Rail, Parpet, Extra, The LA Review of Books, Ajan Media Collective, and Saturation, Race, Art, and the Circulation of Value that came out of MIT Press uh, in 2020. Aliyah Pabani is a Toronto-based artist and audio producer, Previously, she was host and producer of Canada Land's arts and cultural podcast, The Imposter. Her recent work has appeared on the BBC, the Barbican, the Toronto Biennial of Art, Images Festival, and in Mc McSweeney 64, the audio issue. Currently, Elia organizes with the Encampment Support Network and co-produces their podcast, We Are Not the Virus, a documentary series that draws on the four elements, earth, water, wind, and fire, to explore different facets of life in Toronto's encampments through the stories of their residents. The series was named one of Apple Podcasts Best of 2020. I'm so excited uh, to uh, give the floor over to Aliyah, and I just wanna thank again, Galare, Basil, Rowan, and Onyeka for being here today. Um, you are, I am a huge fan, you know that. I've been watching your work for many years and I just can't believe that we get to be in this space together today. So thank you so much for being here. And um, yes, welcome, Aliyah. Uh, um, hello, thanks, Nazrin, um, for inviting me to do this. And uh, uh, especially since Anika is a very dear friend of mine. And so it's really nice to sort of being conversation in this in this space. Um, also um, really great to kind of engage with uh, the work of the other panelists through some of the themes uh, that I initially observed in Anika's work. Um, thanks to Mercer for the invite, to Julia, to Anna, um, and to all of you people I can't perceive right now who are on this uh, call. <laughs> Um, I guess I'll start with uh, just basically kind of talking about, as Nazrin mentioned, the, uh, the title of this conversation, To Go to the Site of a Wreck, uh, was borrowed from uh, the Adrian Rich poem that, um, that uh, Basil and Ruan um, reference. Uh, and the, the, the poem kind of, begins with a sort of narrative I describing the experience of awkwardly putting on gear after having read, uh, read the book of myths um, in order to descend into the ocean to explore a shipwreck. And in that process of descent, there's this sort of disintegration that happens. Um, Rich writes, and now it is easy to forget what I came for among so many who have always lived here swaying their crenellated fans between the reefs and besides, you breathe differently down here. I came to explore the wreck. The words are purposes, the words are maps. I came to see the damage that was done and the treasures that prevail. Um, and then uh, as the kind of descent continues um, at the moment of arrival at the site, there's this narrative turn where the explorer becomes the wreck or the site itself, 
Um, and the poem continues, I am she, I am he, whose drowned face sleeps with open eyes, whose breasts still bear the stress, whose silver copper vermeil cargo lies obscurely inside barrels, half wedged and left to rot. And um, I think the question, you know, for panelists uh, here or conversationalists, interlocutors, um, is about this idea of the return, which is a kind of common theme in diaspora narratives or narratives about migration and colonialism. And I'm just wondering if each um, interlocutor can speak to uh, how they complicate the idea of the return in their work. Um, not only the, the idea to this about, of the return to this notion of home or a particular like nation potentially, um, but to specific sites of ruin or historical trauma, which is um, something that happens in uh, all of your work to some extent. Um, I was thinking also about how um, just the idea, like I didn't really think about the word return itself uh, much before, but it kind of has this, um, like it kind of has this strange, like the word re meaning back and, and then turn to turn. And there's something about like turning back that feels like a kind of encircling or something. It feels like recursive in this way that um, almost feels like redundant or negates itself or something. So I was just thinking about, yeah, this idea of the return and if, and if uh, each of you could kind of speak to um, that idea and how it, how it occurs in your work and how you play with it. I could also, yeah, directly address somebody, Anyeka. <laughs> I was uh, kind of waiting for this dun, 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 what is my camera on um, moment um, but yeah I can, I can start I guess um, maybe I think the idea like the start of this so I've been kind of researching looking into colonial film archives and specifically the colonial film unit um, which was this kind of UK state run visual propaganda um, machine of the like early 20th century for like five years. And I'm not sure if I would like classify that and um, like the interest that got me into it as, a, like, as something propelled by an idea of return. I think um, kind of a bit more. I think instead of, I don't think I would, would have been thought about it in terms of return, I think I would have thought about it in terms of some kind of like vague uh, search and what, some kind of vague search, I was like missed, I was kind of looking for something. Um, and I'm not sure, I, maybe I was looking in some way for something perhaps that was missing and maybe I would have like thought about it in terms of like a search for home, but um, I'm someone that's lucky enough to feel quite at home where they are. Um, because that that home exists uh, in a few different multi in, in multiply or in some kind of multiplicity. I think. Um, but I think I was there seemed to be an absence or a gap or something that I was like, looking for, and then I felt like I kind of found it when I was looking at some archival material, and I kind of never will forget the first time I came across one of these newsreels. Um, and it was from like, Pathé, British Pathé, and it was it featured this woman dancing, and she and it's something that's kind of repeated in a few of my films. This figure of this woman from Enugu in Nigeria, which is really close to where my family are from, and she dances in this particular way that really kind of like I don't know activated and roused did something for me um, because she like reminded me not only of my mum and my grandmother but also of myself, and it was like this kind of experience of seeing seeing this line this kind of through line um, from then to now from like this film to myself um, that I became kind of interested in continuing to search out 
despite the kind of container or package in which this connection, this kind of uh, this buzzing, this kind of um, uh, I don't really have a very good word for it um, came about, um, despite the fact that it was in this kind of really um, racist colonial package, I was interested in pursuing it. And the journey towards following that is kind of, or the process of following that not journey, kind of like led me to think a bit more broadly about what these images meant today. I was summoned. I think I was asked to unmute, so I will, I will go ahead. Um, I think I can respond. I mean, first, I wanted to thank everyone for this occasion. It's a pleasure to be in a conversation with all of you. I think I can respond to the question in two ways. One is uh, an obsession with a certain form and return to it and to explore and understand what are the possibilities of it, however tried and however uh, difficult it might be to evade the cliches of the format, um, meaning uh, specifically, you know, thinking about essay film and, you know, its history and not only thinking about the possibilities of the format itself, but like thinking about what constitutes an essay and returning to this question over and over again with some sort of an obsession. Um, but also, um, I'm interested in giving myself um, exercises um, you know, such as taking a photo of the sunset and re in returning to the possibilities of playing with form um, as a challenge of doing something that's been seemingly done over and over again, but from a different position um, and thinking specifically uh, through the history of the essay film format, for example, um, you know, something that a lot of leftist uh, Western European predominantly men have contributed to the film, engaging with topics of violence and conflict in the global south, but really thinking about an inverse relation to the format and, and engaging the format from the position of being from the global south and making the material limitations and questions of access and mobility as part of the material conditions of how the narrative is formed. Um, and I can get into a little bit of um, what I'm doing right now in terms of the return also in, um, thematically as a way of looking at a process of decay and looking at a process of a ruination by uh, looking at particular architecture and sites and buildings, et cetera, um, and kind of this marking of time and, and letting five, 10 years pass and looking at the, the decaying conditions of, um, of a, of a building, a site that's been left and abandoned and vacant. But um, for now, uh, I'm gonna let this pass to other artists. Um, obviously, uh, hi everyone, nice to be a hall. Um, for us, I think um, being Palestinian, the issue of return has such a um, heavy weight on it because we are, a you know, people who were um, for forcibly displaced um, and are not allowed to return to their homeland. So it's, you know, for, for many, it's not even an option. Um, so the right of return is, is something that, you know, you grow up, uh, you grow up with and, it, and, it, and it's really embedded in your uh, ex experience of longing for a um, homeland that is constantly shifting and disappearing, whether you're outside of Palestine or in Palestine, because the settler colonial project of ethnic cleansing essentially continues to this day. We just woke up this morning to another house demolished, another um, family forcibly displaced from where they're living in Jerusalem. Um, so it's, it's something that, um, is with us whether we want it to be with us or, or not. And I think the way that we think about return is really trying to um, expand it and also take it out of a certain form of colonial capture. 
So um, in the project that Ms. Yoon um, spoke about and you um, spoke about that poem, what we were really thinking about was a sort of return um, of that what of that that has been er erased or suppressed um, or silenced and, and the way in which um, times and spaces mutate and slip and fold in and out of each other. So it's really about expanding it into a kind of um, wider multiplicity for us that is about getting out of colonial time, essentially. So with that project, one of the things we were um, doing was looking at a set of Neolithic masks that were looted from Palestine. Um, that some of them ended up in Michael Steinhardt, and I don't know if you guys have heard about him. And he's just been investigated for crazy amounts of things that he's um, been looting. But what was interesting for us was how can we treat that um, these Neolithic masks as a living archive that we can return in a different form now and use for for our own performative ritual. So it's really about thinking how the archaic is speaking to the contemporary and how things don't really die. Um, it's it's a big this this I mean I don't, I don't know I could have a whole thing just about return. <laughs> so I I think for us it's. Um, it's also thinking about just multiple forms of return of things and times and spaces and impulses and um, getting away from an idea of a singularity as well and opening up to a much more multiple space that's also about becoming other. So. Yeah, I'll just add to that that really it's about, you know, uh, return is really about activating something like in the present. Like that's what we're constantly trying to do. And so, but in a non-nostalgic, yeah. Absolutely, in a non-nostalgic way, but it thinks in a in a very sort of present and more sort of in a in a in a line of projection, rather than even in the line of fiction, but more sort of what could be, and then, you know, um, it's like and how can we sort of um, uh, catapult in that direction? Let's say um, so. It's return, but it's not actually returning to a past that you know or to a place that you would be ever been um, so it's the actually yeah you said that yeah. slippages of time essentially is a, a very important um, yeah it's between those times and defying colonial time really yeah um, yeah thank you I um, that really dovetails well into sort of the next thing I wanted to ask about which is um, uh, Rwanda uh, Basil, in your like when you were speaking about uh, in an interview, your work, uh, and yet my mask is destroyed, the one that you're talking about, about kind of reproducing these uh, Neolithic masks. Um, uh, you talk about this idea of, um, of uh, like the living fabric being destroyed. Um, so, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but you talked about sort of how like maybe the living fabric is is how you describe it as sort of like lived structures, vegetation, um, land, uh, lived history, community, and memory. That kind of like maybe is a working definition of uh, living fabric. Um, and I guess I kind of want to think um, ask about sort of this interesting idea of absence, kind of as a space of possibility rather than a lack and um, because you also uh, spoke about how um, that there's this kind of process in which presently young Palestinians have been re uh, returning to the sites of villages that were destroyed and depopulated in 1948 and probably onwards like um, and despite them being sites that are defined by absence or misdirection um, you kind of mentioned the way that Israelis um, will plant trees to sort of cover over uh, ruins and the existence, make them hard to uh, navigate to. Um, and, uh, but the, the kind of like, you sort of contrast it to places that are made 
sort of unavailable to visit because they become like archaeological sites, for instance, which which lends them a kind of like fixity. There's something about this other way in which they still uh, have some movement or something. And I was thinking about how like monuments, for instance, though uh, they um, they don't draw attention to their erasure in a way in the same way, like they're easy to navigate towards, but their form um, doesn't, uh, uh, yeah, it doesn't contain a kind of like, it's, 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 it's about stabilizing a kind of narrative, right, in a way and fixing it. And so, sorry, I'm getting to the question. <laughs> but I guess you're, <laughs> you're speaking about how um, in the process of um, youth sort of revisiting these sites and activating them anew uh, with like, you know, food and eating, dancing, singing, that um, it does that thing that you were talking about kind of like creates a sense of like embodied time, uh, maybe like a, a sense of futurity that emerges from the process of inhabiting the space. Um, and I guess, yeah, I think that that's a really interesting sort of idea of like, you know, rebuilding in a way that is, um, yeah, is not necessarily uh, dependent on there being sort of like evidence. Um, and, you know, these spaces are kind of like an absence rather than, the, you know, the presence of, of evidence or whatever. And so I was thinking about, um, I, I was just wondering whether, um, like in, in all of your work, there is some sort of like encounter with an absence or there is um, maybe a sense that like, you know, as Anika said, sort of like this idea, of not necessarily a return, but a, like a, a, a going to a place to find something in search of something. Um, there are references, Gilare, uh, Basil and Ruan in both your work to like Roberto Bolaño's uh, fiction, you know? And um, so I guess I'm wondering sort of, uh, if you could speak to, yeah, the idea of what the encounter with an absence um, opens up also, or, or what are kind of the, you know, strategies you deploy in your work for sort of like filling in those spaces. Anyeka, you also have, you know, a piece of audio fiction in your work that you, that you include. And so, um, yeah, so just um, if you could speak a little bit to um, in some way, yeah, how your work sort of like fills in those, those, those gaps and what, what the, what the um, encounter with absence or the lack of evidence or something um, facilitates in terms of um, imagining alternative uh, ways in which those sites can um, exist in the future, if that makes sense. It's a very, very wordy Speaking of being recursive, I'm, yeah, I'm very, I'm not a clear question asker, unfortunately, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, it was good. Should we, should we begin? Because we were asked to unmute, so we unmuted. Um, yeah, and there's a lot to say about this for us. I'm going to try to keep it short. I, I think, um, I mean, one of the main things that we're talking about, um, that we had just been talking about and, and, and you were sort of thinking through is um, the question of it's essentially colonial time, which is always about creating a dead time for those who are colonized um, and turning them into relic, into object. Um, and for us, the struggle is really a struggle over time because what we're struggling for is, is to say, no, these are living sites, right? These are not dead sites. And also, if you think about all the, the looted material culture um, that is in the West, this was all part of living fabrics, right? These are not these kind of fossilized objects that are dead in museum um, ar archives and, and exhibitions. And, and, um, and really, is our struggle is that, is that struggle over the time to say that which is dead is actually um, living. And it was, I mean, also this project really drew, I mean, a lot of our projects draw on what people are doing. So it's not just our own sort of projections, but we were really 
um, inspired by the young people who were going back to these sites and um, engaging with them in a really very different way and not seeing them just as a site of um, trauma. trauma. Um, and in that way, you know, we, we really, since we find ourselves in the wreck again and again, it, it does force us, and I think particularly like our generation in Palestine, to think about what it means and to be in the wreck. How can we, from within the wreck, create spaces of potential? And um, how being in the lack or something we're thinking about a lot recently is being in the negative is not really just um absence it's a, it's a it's an i it's trying to think about how within something that is broken the need is not always to fix it and to become whole but from within the breaks how can we generate possibilities of um resistance and joy and love and and and, and, and these things are fleeting um but I don't, you know, we are we are constantly in this state of breaking in in Palestine. So how can we, in that state, within that, um, conti continue to keep this kind of virtual space alive, which is the space of what could be, uh, and how do people, how are people doing that? Is what's interesting for us, and then our projects just kind of push it to, yeah. And then I'll just add quickly Sorry, because we're two other, people because we're two. So I'll just add quickly that. Absence uh, for us also in a sort of more day-to-day -day, um, is very generative in a sense that for us, like being anonymous is part, like is 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 um, is empowering, right? It's um, your ability to be anonymous is empowering, and so I am he, I am she, is and the masks become like these activation tools for us to think about how uh, from the negative space, from absence, uh, from being other. From the slippages, we can generate um, um, potential, but also um, empowerment, essentially, uh, uh, for us to yeah. And it comes out of necessity, I think. You know, it's it, it's yeah, it's literal. Um, I guess what something that you said, something that from all the things that people have said. Well, I guess I wanted to say something about absence and that. Maybe like it's absence of a certain kind, right? Like, because maybe I don't know if it's necessarily such a binary between the absence and presence. It's just not a certain kind of presence, a presence that's kind of recognized um, in a certain kind of way of knowing. Because I, I don't know, when you were talking earlier, I kept on thinking about this, I guess, <laughs> about this story about when I was in Canada, this like anecdote of something that kept on happening to me. People would be like, oh, you're from London, you're from the UK, that must be so nice to like. Live, live somewhere that there's so much history around like that all these like old stuff like you've got stuff from like the 14th century and it's just there and I was just I remember just being really perplexed by this like this it's happened to me so many times I was like wow why are people so into this idea of there being history or this like division between like Europe and North America but one has like live like history present and one doesn't and I was just like but the history is there it's just in other forms and so I guess this idea keeps on like coming, coming back to me when you were speaking about like the different types of, of presences. And I think when I first, and also when I went to Nigeria and did some research there in terms of this question of like what the archives mean in Nigeria, I also found that like the ways of thinking through history or, or like recording history were just just very well i don't want to use the word different but they just weren't like it wasn't a monument or it wasn't a book or it wasn't a museum um it was like i don't know a story it was like a gesture it was like other stuff and so i think that's what i've been interested in trying to do is like put that other stuff i like this idea of living fabric um alongside or like put like use that and that be a medium to kind of try to, to to think through like what I, what I was dealing with these kind of like historical events or like these ways of like thinking through um, particular places, people, and times. So yeah, I don't know. Maybe I need to try and have a think of another word that isn't absent <laughs> for the for this particular thing. Yeah, that's a good point. Actually, just to quickly respond, like I was just thinking about how. 
like maybe um, in the Canadian context, the idea of a lack of history um, or like a younger history uh, in some ways is related to the way that there is this terra nullius attitude. Um, it's kind of like a colonial mindset where time begins at the moment of like settling the land and that in some way not recognizing the way that time um, is imprinted here is about not being able to recognize the land and um, and to be connected to the land, which is kind of like a very settler, um, like guilty as charged, <laughs> like mindset in some way to not be like, or also just to not be connected to the land generationally or culturally. So yeah, thanks for that insight. And uh, yeah, just wondering if I go over to you now, Galari. Sure. Um, I think it's time I'm going to pull that dorky slideshow real quick because it gives me more focus to talk about material things. Um, so with the current project, um, I mean, completely different context, completely different uh, course of events and relations and dynamics. Uh, I've been looking at the uh, former embassy of Iran that was in Washington, D.C., and it's been vacant and abandoned for the past 40 years because of the severing of diplomatic ties. Um, and the country, uh, the embassy embodies a contradiction in the sense that it's a diplomatic mission, which gives it uh, a particular status and protection in a different country as a territory. Um, but also, and that's this image in the middle, but also it's a it's in a state of decay because uh, the government of Iran doesn't really claim it. And it's a country that's been under an embargo for decades. So the U.S. government um, and persons, you know, there's a lot of restrictions on law. It's against the law to benefit the property of a country under an embargo. Um, so it's a state of um, contradictions in its slow decay. Um, and its upkeep, uh, which is in the custody of the State Department, the U.S. State Department, has been very slow, close to non-existent. It's just kept in the status, in the state of um, not falling apart. It's bare minimum. Um, and so, so that kind of expanded into looking at um, two other properties among 12 that belongs to Iran in the U.S. Um, and the other one is the ambassador's house, which is close and they share a courtyard with the embassy. And the third one is the former consulate general of Iran that's in New York. And it's a, currently it's a, it's a, it's a running uh, famous blue chip gallery in Manhattan. Um, and I was thinking about you know, the, the other contradictions in the sense that you know, when the embassy was taken over by the revolutionary students, you know, some of these objects uh, were taken. Um, and then the US State Department claims that they have put the art objects in a storage facility and they've been stored, even though there's no clarity as to what, what this facility is or is there any kind of, um, there's no inventory of any of the objects. And um, so I was thinking about, you know, this, this lack of this, ab this absence of, of an archive, this impossibility of an archive. Um, and the fact that some of these items, some of the, one of the most kind of famous narratives of this taking over was that the students dumped thousands of bottles of alcohol into the fountain in the courtyard as a symbol against the, the debaucherous regime that was uh, overthrown in Iran. Um, so some of this stuff, we know that they were tossed away, they're destroy destroyed, some were kept and some were put in the storage facility according to the State Department. Um, but I'm, I mean, the project is more about thinking and imagining, you know, the, uh, the hierarchy and, and the contradiction that, you know, a contemporary gallery is where objects go to end up in private collections, as opposed to the, the, the antiquities or the artifacts or whatever that was, or the furniture that was in that room that was put in a storage facility to be preserved as some sort of ransom against the current regime of Iran to be returned to the Iranian people once the regime is over. And to engage with this narrative as an artist for me, you know, the biggest challenge is, I mean, nostalgia is a big one. Is it possible to engage with this and tell this narrative without nostalgia? And if so, um, you know, a main question for me was to think about 
the hierarchy um, of, of the amount of, of the objects that end up in collections. Maybe, you know, if you go into a lot of those glorious British um, uh, coll colonial collections, uh, there is a sense of um, almost like, a, like an illness of obsession with preserving whatever was dug out from the earth. So thinking about the hierarchies between debris, um, uh, you know, culturally and aesthetically significant objects as opposed to the leaves that become the compost over and over again in this, um, in this, in the environment around these buildings and kind of thinking about um, how to bring them into the space and imagine an archive outside of what's culturally significant or what has uh, a certain value or worth uh, attributed to it. Um, and thinking about how much information are carried through dead leaves as opposed to rolls of film that may or may not have been found at a site of, of conflict or violence or, um, um, and, and, and for me, this question also both with the, with the format of the film and thinking about depicting violence in a cinematic and in an essayistic, in a fictional, whatever way I, I, I engage with it, uh, was to think about, I, I, I've been thinking about, you know, is it possible to think about and depict violence through a narrative as a Mobius strip, as opposed to a line or a circle or three dimensional or whatever, but as this thing that defies a beginning and end, defies a cycle. Uh, because in my particular project, it's important to think about it as, as violence, as a, um, not bound to one territory uh, and not bound to one time. Um, so not thinking about before and after a regime change or before and after a revolution, but as continues through it and not thinking about um, being violence being bound and limited to one geography and, and the, the illusion and giving into this imperial illusion of a refuge uh, being attainable on the other side of a border as is the case with a lot of uh, refugees and stateless people. Thanks for that. Thanks for those thoughtful responses. Um, I um, maybe in a bit of a shift, <laughs> shifting gears way, um, I wanted to talk about sound because it's uh, something I care about deeply <laughs> and notice um, and often notice it when it's not necessarily meant to be noticed because it doesn't draw attention to itself. And I think in your works, maybe it does a little bit more uh, draw attention to itself. Um, not only because uh, it, you know, features prominently, but also maybe in some ways is sort of untethered uh, to the image or uh, sort of moving moving in one direction and then uh, changing direction. Um, there's um, uh, kind of an interplay between sound and, and image um, that can produce maybe sometimes a sort of disorienting or destabilizing effect, dis dis destabilizing a narrative um, potentially. Um, Gilare, I was thinking about uh, your film, uh, Men of My Dreams, where there is um, the, the sound of tape cycling that comes up over and over again. And in, in a way that sort of like echoes the, the wave pattern, but then, you know, not, not entirely, like made me in a moment wonder whether the wave was also being sort of like repeated um, like, or artificial or something, like whether you could trust the image because of the way that the sound was. Um, drawing attention to its own materiality in a way. And um, yeah, Anyeka, um, in, your, in your work, there's, yeah, that moment. Well, one of the things is that there, there are the, almost these, uh, well, there's this drone that has a kind of like repetition with difference in a way, but then there's also these uh, sounds that feel like so um, almost like strangely cartoonish, like Foley effects or something, uh, like a like a like a cartoon, <laughs> like squeaks and stuff like that, like almost like uh, not comical. I don't want to say comical because 
I know that the vibe is generally nightmarish, but um, there is also like a maybe a playfulness. And I think that that, that you know, is evident a little bit, that playfulness in, in the final scene where I don't know if everyone's aware, but that's Anyeka dancing on the credits. Um, <laughs> the highlight of the film for me, really. <laughs> but um, but yeah, so I guess I'm just wondering um, if, if people can speak a little bit to uh, sort of how you conceive of sound in your work, um, how it, how the, pr the process of um, uh, conceptualizing that element um, interacts with your use of images, like where it begins and how one changes the other um, and like, what what the kind of importance of sound is in general to your sort of like broader project? Um, for, for this film, for a circle, I mean, actually, no, maybe for a lot of my films, but um, I really, I guess I'm, I'm interested in the relationship, I'm sure like everyone between image and sound, but I'm interested in maybe investing more in sound than in image um, often. And for this particular project, it was, I decided not to use any archival images um, and to try and imagine the archive through sound. That was, that was kind of like the premise that started the project. Like, what would it be like to imagine these films that I may or may not have seen, but I've seen many similar ones through sound? Um, so that was really a starting point to kind of like explore. Um, and the sound came, came first. And the sound is so much more layered um, than these like very, very static kind of stayed images that move a little bit. Um, but uh, I mean, yeah, there's something about the fact that you, not the fact, but what you said in terms of like how sometimes sound can be like a bit, you know, un inobtrusive, unobtrusive or unbecoming. Like you don't, you don't quite know what's going on deep in the track. <laughs> like sometimes you can't tell what's being done, but it can have this kind of affect um, that um, is, is pretty powerful. Um, and I, I thought about that in terms of um, as, as yet my mouth so powerful in terms of like the sound really takes me to this other place. Um, and I, I think for me that's kind of that that transportation was very like it's very felt. Um, so it's operating in this kind of different level um, to what the images are doing. Um, but yeah, I was just really trying to do as many things as possible with the sound. Like there was, like there was, I was just like, oh, it'll be fun to like muck around with Foley um, and see what we can do and like make this radio play that has a lot that's really busy. And the way in which in the radio play that we can like move through time in this kind of almost seamless place, seamless way we can move through time and space um, sonically. So that was interesting. And then also working with the idea of a chorus, which is always something that I keep on coming back to. How can I create like a choral sound with multiple voices? Um, and then how can I also work with the sound that we make in sounding out a physical space in our mouths? And how can that be like part of a score? So yeah, I was just trying to do as many things as possible to evoke these colonial films, but also to kind of evoke uh, some kind of feeling of what I was trying to say with the film, which in general, I guess with the film in the end, the last image is this kind of like abandoned archive. And my kind of question was like, what what would it mean to, to, to let these, what would it mean to let the colonial archives rot? Like, and what would we be left with that we can't, currently like um appreciate because there are so many like as this kind of illness <laughs> of preservation the Clara talks about it's so busy like so what will we let what will we left with if we didn't have that at all and how would we approach thinking through uh particular histories people and places without all that kind of busyness thanks for that can i ask a little follow-up <laughs> <laughs> permission to approach the bench. <laughs> um, I was wondering too if you could speak a little bit about sort of like because you uh, one thing that I noticed watching it or yeah watching it and listening listening to it and watching it incidentally um, 
is uh sort of the way like like were were you sort of like beaming sound were you like sounding the space as well like were you like playing sound into the space and or were you, was was that constructed in like a post production way there was I mean we did lot I did yeah you know, we did lots of different things sometimes we played sometimes I recorded playing sound in space and then sometimes it was like um more of a like digital thing but yeah i was doing you know i was putting like microphones in boxes and inside things i was just like i really what it was really like experimentation and because i'm not someone that like really knows the science or the technical things around sound it's something that i really am more like feeling through so when i was in nigeria doing a lot of like field recording i was just do like you know just really playing around Anyone can take it. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I guess we have a lot to, I guess sound is like a huge part of our practice. And I come from like a music background, so I'm originally a musician. Um, but I will say like maybe two things that are, that come to my mind as like very significant in our sound practice was essentially like <clears throat> when we first started actually working together, one of the things that we, um, one of the things that like one of the our in both of one of the interests we had was this sort of saturation of images that were sort of coming out from Palestine and that were um, you know sort of um, almost like uh, the event but also the images had lost their potency because it had been repeated so much and so really our sort of uh, collaborative venture into sound was um, coming from that sort of, you know, trying to think about this, you know, sound as a sort of uh, a solution or a sort of like a uh, way to the, you know, so we couldn't really pick up the camera. We didn't know what to film. Like we didn't know uh, why we would be filming. Like what is it that we're going to film? So, so sound was a way for us to, and I can talk about sound for a long, a long, a very long time and including like the first projects that we did that were very much sound based. Uh, but I'll stop there and I'll say that the other significant thing for us today is that we actually um, we compose a lot of the sound uh, before we film, before we do any filming, and we also so we do it with, to actually to text. So a lot of our projects start with text, and and then we sometimes even literally write a script, um, and then we compose sound to this text and script before we even go f to film. And so the sound is really informing like color, movement, rhythm, all kinds of location, uh, all kinds of things. And then obviously it's conceptually on its own, uh, thinking about all the concepts and things that we were thinking about. So it's a, you know, uh, and then I'll say one last thing, which is we do, we do live, we do a lot of it live. So we record, mm -hmm. we record ourselves jamming in the studio hours and hours of it and then we like micro edit that and that includes a lot of experimentation jamming on synthesizers and yeah and experimenting with video live as well uh, because we you know because we do live video too so yeah but yeah. yeah and then maybe i'll just add that there's a, there's a way that sound um defies certain forms of like containment or is less is less fixed than an image an image can be very um yeah, it just fixes things too much, and sound is the way that we can unfix things, like kind of have them not be contained. Um, and like what Anita was saying is that it becomes a very embodied thing in the way that it, you know, um, almost transports you into different spaces in, in a way that I think, at least for us, images are just too heavy, or they're, they're too trained, almost, you know, so, so sound is a is a way for us to be uncontained. Um, yeah, I mean, I would add that in my process, I usually, I'm, I don't have any um, skills in sound or know much about the craft of it. So I collaborate with uh, sound designers and composers. Um, in the last two projects, I've worked with my partner to design the sound and the process is usually 
um, the sources of the sound are drawn conceptually in relation to the project and I have a sense of the, the mood or the feel. Um, and I use sound, I think, with image in a way that I think um, I rarely ever do I use diegetic sound. It's always coll collage together for in order to hope for a different kind of synthesis um, out of the image. Um, or like the this like going against this fixity that Juan was mentioning, uh, but also really thinking about and and thinking about uh, the last scene in Onyeka's uh, piece with the dance, which is one of my favorite, is to really think about affect as a tool of storytelling, not as a way of in reinforcing a narrative, but really using it as one tool um, to for the narrative to be formed, um, and. Um, so the, the, the process is usually kind of um, foraging different sources of sound and testing it out to see what it feels like with the image and, and using music and some movement and dance also um, in conjunction with that. Okay, thanks all. Um, I'm just um, waiting on a dispatch. Okay. So we have an audience question. I don't know if I'm the, am I the reader of the audience question or is Nazrin gonna be the, Nazrin, will you take it from here? Yeah, I can take it from here. Thank you so much. Um, thank you and thank you all for <laughs> great thoughts. Um, we have one question so far um, and it's a really beautiful one. I'll just read it slowly. Uh, thank you all so much for your, your really thoughtful reflections. I'm so grateful. As we all try to resist the pressure of colonial time, I've been thinking about the importance of imagination, the ability to work through the wreckage by holding onto a political vision or a hope of something otherwise. There have been projects that take imagination and fictive archives or institutions as their thrust. I'm thinking here of the work of Walid Raid, for instance, or Khalil Rabah, but how does imagination figure for your work as a way that resists linearity or finality? Dreams in Galaria's work seems one way. I don't know if maybe Galaria, you want to go first. Um, sure, I think the turn to dreams for me started from uh, a dream journal. Um, and thinking about the, the chaos of, 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 of the meanings that are in the dream, but then really embracing the, the, um, the potentials of, of creating narratives um, in a dream format because of its uh, possibilities and openness um, in meaning making or not the necessity for meaning making in the way that our brains work and logic works. Um, I mean, one thing that I've been, reading lately and has been very um, uh, informative and really uh, pleasant as a, I'm, I'm re I really like filmmakers who write about film and write about cinema and write about their process. And I started reading uh, Mohamed Meles's uh, The Dream, A Diary of the Film, uh, in which he uh, shares a lot of um, diary style writings and notes that he wrote through the process of um, location from location scouting when he visited the, the Palestinian refugee camps before the Nakba to start his film. Um, and the way that he turned to, uh, and the way that he had a fixed idea, he had a, you know, he had a plan to go make a film about this one or two Palestinian families that he was following. Um, but then how, how the film was determined by his experience of listening to, um, to the people talk um, and, and the coming up of the dream and the way that that beautifully opened the, the film into such a, such a rich um, uh, vignettes of, of imagining a past and a present and also thinking about uh, what followed his, his process of filmmaking and the devastation and, and the erasures that happened. Um, I, I really, it's been, it's been very inspiring for me uh, lately and I just wanted to share that. Yeah, 
Yeah, that's an incredible film. I, Gloria, I know you told me about it. I didn't even know about it. And I, it felt like such an important one because I couldn't have even imagined the question before I watched that film of asking uh, Palestinians under occupation what their dreams are like. Um, Rowan, Basil, I don't know if you want to take it from here or Onyeka, or if you have any comments about the question. Um, I think there's just so many ways that we're thinking about that, but something that does come um, to mind for me, which will, will seem kind of tangential, but um, um, in the project that we've been discussing, um, when we returned to the destroyed sites of these villages, there are about 500 of, of them across historic Palestine. Um, there was something in the site that was, it was just possessed and he felt possessed being in it. And, and that feeling was really coming from all these like non-human entities in these spaces from like the vegetation to the insects. And we especially had gone during sp spring and there was a way in which um, all these kind of non-human beings in a way um, were creating a sort of magic in the space. And there was this almost like hallucinogenic sort of like effect that we had um, being there where we, 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 we almost for a time could imagine you know, an unoccupied life. And it was very visceral and very real and very, very powerful. Um, so, you know, for us in terms of, I mean, sometimes we are really drawing from things like that in terms of how we are able to imagine another possibility. And, and, it's, and, it's, and it's often for us, things like that. The land itself, for me, there's something very, in the relationship to land and the inscriptions that are in the land and, and there's like forms of magic that are there that we don't know anything about really. That for me is one way that we think about it almost. Yeah, yeah it's, so also something buried, that comes to mind. it's also the buried history that comes to life almost when you visit these sites and you, you activate them just by being there. We're not so. the only things on the planet. There are many things happening. And I think that goes back to what Anika was saying in terms of archives. like. You know, it's not just in our side. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, um, I guess I think about these things in terms of um, thinking about the conditional. Like, what, you know, if you ask the question what could or what would, like, then there's like a lot of possibility to answering that question. Um, and maybe, I think something that I tried to, when, do, like, after having that experience, I said of like watching that first archival film, I tried to, like, whenever I was, like, looking at archival stuff, just like, be, I mean, this, I don't, I almost don't want to say this because it sounds really, like, cliche, but, like, just being very open to whatever came. And sometimes what, and what comes is, like, unexpected. And sometimes, I don't know, you get like a, a memory or something. Or like, I remember one time I was like reading, I was in the National Archives in Kew, in West London, and I was reading this kind of, um, this, this report from one of these colonial people, um, administrators, and it was like handwritten and then it was scratched all over because, um, and then it, something was written on top of it. And I just like immediately thought, Imagine this guy in like a really long pajamas with like a weird hat, sitting in bed with a fever, um, and then writing this report somewhere in like West Africa, like, um, and then writing something that he didn't recognize and like falling asleep and then waking up again and then like scratching all over it. And I mean that kind of led me down like a you know some some other place to think about these kind of like these kind of like feverish dreams or fever dreams. But I think. I'm trying to be like open to like lots of different things, whether it's like a story or a scent or a smell. Like at the moment, I'm kind of working with smells a lot in my work because that just came up through kind of like I don't know experience and like thinking about like what um, 
we, our, our senses are, you know, are more than our eyes and our ears. So what does it mean to work with smell? What does it mean to work with food? Um, what does it mean to work with senses outside of those five? So I think, yeah, I'm in terms of like imagination that's challenging fixity or linearity, it's about like there being multiple ways of approaching something or understanding something, gaining knowledge or experiencing something, and that being a kind of presence in my practice. Amazing, thank you. Yeah, I feel like in your film, Monique, I could smell the archives at some point. Like that's how visceral the images were. <laughs> um, I don't know if you guys have any questions to each other. I don't want to put you on the spot, but I feel like this is a rare opportunity to have all of you in one space. And um, well, and there are no more questions from the audience, I think. <laughs> I'm so bad at like, I don't know, I, I don't know, this whole conversation has been like, oh, I really wish we were just like all in one place having a chat. Because <laughs> it's kind of, it's so difficult to like have a conversation in this kind of um, mm -hmm. environment. But it's been so nice, like, l like listening to what you've been saying and like looking at those images that you had go around. It's like, oh yeah, there's like so many things I want to talk about in terms of like ruin and buildings and architecture that I kind of am interested in. But I find this format really difficult <laughs> in terms of having those conversations, but yeah. Totally, yes. I, yeah, I mean, I was just texting with Julie and I was like, I hope we get to do a redux in real life because this can't be the only time. <laughs> I think if, yeah, I don't know. I think maybe this is such a nice way to end. And I don't know, Galaria, Rowan, Basil, any last comments or? Not really, just, uh, yeah. I mean, I think as Onyeka was saying, it's a bit, there's so much to talk about. And then yeah. it's like an awkward format always sort of, you know, <laughs> you know how it is. Yeah. We're <laughs> doing it long enough now, so. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, yeah. Well, I was yeah, really... just moments in the conversation where people were just um, like just giving little teasers of the possibilities of what you can speak about. <laughs> like that's all when you were like, I could go off for a long time around sound. I was like, is anyone <laughs> able to stay for another hour? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, thank you for um, yeah everybody's small teasers maybe there's longer conversations that can be had in some way but I think even what you shared now there's a lot to think about in relation to our own work I think thank you thank you all this was really great I really enjoyed it and thank you and thank you Aaliyah too all right Thank you all for coming and I hope to see you next, no, in two weeks, February 9th for uh, Michelle Jakes, Sebastian DeLine and Jocelyn Kernan's conversation on collections in museums, which is gonna be, I think, really cool. So thank you all and yeah, have a good afternoon, have a good evening, have a good day and see you soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye.